Welcome back. We are those guys. We hope to be your guys here on Ride the Wave Media. I'm Alex Hardy, and with me as always, Nick Ferguson, former NFL safety. You see the hat. You know what it is. You were there for the start of Tom Brady's career. This is those guys' recap of the Patriots Dynasty documentary, which you can find on Apple TV. We're doing episodes seven and eight here, so if you'd like to hear or take from the jump from the start when Nick Ferguson was there on that opposite sideline for the New York Jets, make sure you go back earlier in the podcast or YouTube feeds to find those earlier episodes. We are doing two episodes per recap uh, right here on Ride the Wave Media. So, Nick Ferguson, how are you feeling? We're all at the home stretch here. Yeah, I'm feeling great, and this thing is starting to rev up with every episode. So many intricate details about what went on in the locker room with the New England Patriots. And, and here's the crazy thing about it. Like, everyone wants to win. Everyone wants to win. No really? To, look, no one wants to be a loser, but not everyone is willing to make the sacrifices necessary to emerge, you know, victorious. And that's one thing I love about uh, the, the series. And you can say that, uh, as so some Patriots fans have said, that this is just another gut punch attack against Bill Belichick. But say whatever you want to say, the players have an opportunity to speak their piece, and they are really speaking it. We'll get to the sentiments some of those players had on camera and those off camera playing for those Patriots. And Nick Ferguson, you talked about the ultimate sacrifice in the name of winning. And to open episode seven, Robert Kraft makes the ultimate sacrifice in the name of U.S.-Russia geopolitical relations. He has his Super Bowl ring with him as he joins Rupert Murdoch, who has now showed up in the documentary. And they're in Moscow. And, hey, Vladimir Putin is interested in that Super Bowl ring. He puts the ring on his finger. He looks at Robert Kraft and says, I could kill a man with this ring. And Kraft replies, you could kill someone without it as well. That ring stays in Vladimir Putin's pocket. And to this day, Robert Kraft has never seen the third Super Bowl ring ever since, Nick. Well, you know what? That was one of those big uh, political international incidents that one can say that was avoided because you have to think about in, in Putin's case, he's used to just kind of having gifts uh, bestowed upon him and not returning it. And I yeah. guess he thought, you know, once again, no one translated the idea that in America, no, when we allow you to hold something, you're supposed to return it. So that's where communications fell apart. And to see Robert Kraft go, well, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to ask for it back? Yes, you're supposed to ask for it back. But he realized, you know what? He wasn't in a good old US of A, so he couldn't do it. So he just kind of chalked that up to, you know what? I gave it to her, right? And something like that. But once again, I'm glad that uh, a political incident was avoided, but it really kind of changed things for the Patriots and Robert Kraft and how fans actually view them because there are things that's coming later on that would only kind of change the viewpoint of how Kraft is viewed by fans, not just in New England, but just football fans around. But once again, Alex, if you're in that situation, and then Putin takes something from you. I mean, what were you going to do? Would you ask for it back? Or would you just chalk it up as a loss? Listen, I'm, I'm, as, I'm as lucky as Robert Kraft is. I know I've got at least two sitting on my night table back home. And as we're about to see in the documentary as it continues, there are more to come. So to summarize that, I, I would wimp out. I wouldn't say a thing, honestly. If I'm on his home turf, that's why they call it home field advantage. Exactly. We get a montage of the Patriots winning. I mean, Nick, God, based on the Aaron Hernandez episode like we talked about previously, and uh, like we haven't seen the Patriots win football games. They're averaging 12, 13 wins a year throughout this whole time, but I feel like we haven't seen them hoist a Lombardi in like three episodes. Anyway, we see a montage of them winning Super Bowls uh, set to the tune of Tupac's All Eyes on Me, and it was emblematic of the success that the Patriots had. And all eyes are on them. Why? Because everybody's looking up to them as the NFL's best team 
or are all eyes on them because they've got the target on their back and there's things that are to come. And the thing that is to come, Nick, we get transported into the middle of this second wave of success and it's the 2015 AFC Championship game and my eyes roll into the back of my head because I know exactly what's about to come and I know you do as well. But we start with Adam Vinatieri, who at this point, fairly recently, had joined the Indianapolis Colts. Um, and always the funniest thing for me, the, the guy that we touted and praised for the first three Super Bowl wins with the Patriots, he would go on to play more seasons in Indianapolis than he did in New England. So I think people could rightfully identify him as a, as a Colt, but those three rings, he'll always be a Patriot to me. Um, 2015 AFC Championship game, Nick. We've got a uh, you know a bitter rivalry between the Patriots and the Colts, but why 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 are my eyes rolling in the back of my head? What what what's to come here? Well, you know what? Here's what's was interesting because th- there's a lot that goes into those battles between the Patriots, Tom Brady against Peyton Manning. Mm-hmm. So, so that the following years, it just seemed like every time those two teams matched up, the competition committee would get together every single year after those games and change the rules to benefit Peyton Manning and the Colts. Right. Mm-hmm. Every single year, and as a defender, I get upset because I'm just like, listen, there are three phases of the game, and we just can't favor one side of the ball and help out one particular quarterback as he tries to cement himself as one of the best quarterbacks to ever play the game. Right. These battles were always fun and entertaining because when you look at over the well during that time, teams that got into the playoffs or were considered Super Bowl contenders, the Colts, the Pittsburgh Steelers, the New England Patriots, and the Denver Broncos. Those were the faces that you saw. So this rivalry between the Colts and the Patriots, hey man, I look forward to seeing. Uh, you know, you're just throwing me the the, the total bone here. We, we don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. If you want to talk about the history of these great rivalries, um, however, we'd be doing a disservice. And you're, I see what you're doing. You're you're poking me. I'm the one that has to say it. I'm, I'm the one that has to say it. Right. This whole rivalry, this beautiful, eloquent soliloquy yes. that you had on, on those teams. Come on. Was it all undermined because some footballs are under underinflated, according to Tom Brady? Here we go. It's it. You know, I should have seen this coming. It's the Deflategate episode. Mm. You know, well, here's something that was very interesting, uh, even when it was happening live, but more or less rewatching it again. I mean, there, there are certain people who touch the ball on every single play, mm-hmm. both quarterbacks, the centers, but yes, the officials. So I always say that the officials should have been the first individuals to know that the ball seemed to be a little underflated. And the Colts couldn't wait. Coach Pagano couldn't wait to pounce because they had received information from, I believe, the week before. Yes. Something is not right here with the Patriots team. So when you talk about the Patriots and having that bullseye on their back, the bullseye was on their back for so many reasons. When, when, when the team constantly wins, wins, wins. And I don't care what sport it is. Someone is always looking to find ways to to bring them down. Even if everyone is committing the same infractions, only your infraction seems to be that much larger because that was the catalyst for why you were winning. So for me, I always tell people miss me with that idea that the Patriots were the only team that so, so-called bend the rules. Notice I didn't say cheat. I say bend the rules. Because I know there are multiple teams that embark on that same thing. Because it is in the NFL, this phrase, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. Well, we go back to Spygate, and they may not be the only ones bending the rules or cheating. But to this point, back back in uh, you know the previous episode we discussed, they were the only ones to be caught. And so those, sentence are, sen- those senses are heightened, knowing that this team continued to win throughout and you're looking to poke holes in that argument. And the reality that, um, you know, you stated it perfectly, Nick, the, the officials touched the ball every play. They should know. They did know, right? The NFL was looped in a week before, as you mentioned. 
So they allowed this first half to be played before they confiscated the balls because it was more important to get a gotcha, gotcha moment with the Patriots compared to playing what they felt was a fair and balanced game. Meanwhile, we had a very unbalanced game with the Patriots winning 45-7, and they went, they scored 28 unanswered in the second half, knowing that the balls that were in question were replaced by the officials, because again, they allowed a half of football. So I sound like I'm defending this as if it still matters, and you and I both know this really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Um, but we get Bill Belichick the next day after this victory with the report that balls were being significantly underinflated, um, a sense retracted report of how much those balls were underinflated. And at the time, we all kind of suspect that by removing himself from becoming a two time cheater, mentioning Spygate previously, Bill Belichick may be skirting some responsibility when saying that the way the footballs are are Tom's preference, and it's something he can talk about. This is the first of many times we will talk about an inflection point between Bill Belichick and Tom Brady that absolutely do exist. There's a reason that Brady finished his career in Tampa, but it's put under a microscope to begin this arc for the final four episodes of the documentary about how much friction and resistance there was between Belichick and Brady. And I believe it starts by highlighting this press conference immediately following with media clippings and video from Sports Center at the time of why Belichick put Brady out there like that. Yeah, I didn't I didn't really like the way that that was was handled. And in these cases, whatever you want to say about a player or to a player behind closed doors, that happens all the time. But the one thing that you don't want to do, you don't want to put your player in an uncomfortable situation. I felt as though Tom was put in an uncomfortable situation, standing at the podium, ask, answering questions. I think he answered questions for like 30 minutes. Yeah, It was, it was very uncomfortable watching. And it, was, it was, for me, Alex, it would have been better if Bill Belichick said, look, you know, we did everything that we were supposed to do. The balls were checked properly. The balls were changed at one, up, one particular point in the game. And we went, we went forward. So as he typically say, he would say, now we're going to move on to something else. If you don't have any other questions about our next opponent, then, uh, then I'm going to kind of walk out. But he didn't do that. No. By him throwing Tom out there, it only made things worse for Tom. And you're right. His whole idea was that, hey, listen, there were so many allegations that were attached to him. He was trying to escape that, that shadow. Mm. People calling him, hey, man, you just a dirty coach. Yeah, you're one of the best coaches that ever done it. But there's a lot of questions as to how you did it. But you threw your quarterback, you know, definitely under the bus. And, and I want, I wonder, and we didn't get a chance to see it. Put the cameras in that next meeting when both Tom is in the room with every other guy and Bill Belichick is at in the front of the, the room, leading a room. I wonder what that conversation and that dialogue was like. But he did sell Tom up the river with no paddle. Yeah. And, you know, for how uncomfortable Tom was, he reflected on it. And again, the, the, the questions being asked, it, do I sound like this, Nick? When, when credentialed media reporters covering the team ask, Tom, what's up with our hero? Like, is that, is that what I sound like talking about Tom Brady? Because he was a successful quarterback on my team for as long as he was. Tom looked back on it saying, um, I wish I could give you more answers, but don't have those answers. He's not going to talk about it. Uh, Robert Kraft on Brady. He just, he wasn't at his best, but there's a shift in the tone and tenor of dynasty of the documentary where we say goodbye to Tom Brady and Robert Kraft and Bill Belichick and any of the players because they're not going to speak on it. And so the remainder of this episode is carried with old media clippings and embattled and, and Patriots reporters like Tom Curran, um, or Princiati who do great work. Um, Tom's still in the in the market, but they're the ones that have to carry us through this episode, knowing that we're not going to get any commentary from the team itself. And really, at this point, I'm kind of waiting for that Roger Goodell sit down, and it doesn't come for quite a while. In the meantime, going back to 2015, he uh, 
brings in Ted Wells as the independent investigator because the two questions the NFL that needs to be answered is why were some of the footballs not in compliance and was this intentionally done? We don't need to relitigate this. Oh, hey, by the way, guess what? The Patriots are going to the Super Bowl. Did, did we get the final score of that Colt game? No, I mentioned it was 45-7. Did I mention it was 45-7? Documentary didn't mention it was 45-7. Anyway. That was, uh, we, I, I would say what, what wasn't mentioned for a reason, but once again, this is why when this conversation comes up, my response is always the same. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, the Patriots and Tom Brady did something to the balls early on. Okay, fine. Mm-hmm. They changed them. The game went on, and the results were where well, the results were. So for me, it didn't make a difference with the ball if the balls were inflated to the right PSI, under the PSI, or over the PSI. The Colts were going to lose that game regardless, and they did, and they did it in an embarrassing fashion. Now, if the game was really close, now we can bring out our tiki torches and pitchforks and say, well, damn those Patriots, they did it again. But you had an opportunity with fresh balls, and you still lost. Yep. So for me, it's like, shut the hell up. We, um, we can go out of order here because it'd be nice to put a bow on Deflategate and then talk about the Super Bowl in Glendale. I don't know if that's too out of order because the NFL took its time and allowed the Super Bowl to be played. Um, but the, but the short of it is, you know, for one of the most highly publicized, and they talked about how much coverage that there was on this story, leading the today show, leading the new news format show, not just, um, sports content, but it comes down to finding a guy that calls himself the deflator, um, and Tom Brady, not giving up his cell phone. And that ultimately brings the decision that there was, uh, the, the, the correct wording, uh, uh, there was, uh, it was more probable than not that the team was aware of a system to deflate footballs. What the hell I, does that mean? Now, look, it doesn't mean anything. It means they had nothing. Yeah. For me, I live in a world, I used to live in a world of yes, maybe no. Now I live in a world of yes and no. What is probably more likely? What the hell is that? I mean, it doesn't hold up in a court of law, but yeah. that's when we get the Roger Goodell. He sits down for this documentary after they talk about the decision that was made, and he said, "I we don't live in the real world. This is the league. We make the rules, and so what? It's not, you know, this isn't a court of law, right? Well, I mean, you are convicting someone in a court of popular opinion yeah. who had somewhat of a meeting with, I mean, Tom Brady, and then there was the Wells report. So while we didn't see a grand jury, it wasn't the Supreme Court, you still went through the preliminary process of bringing someone in, questioning them, combing through the details. So it was like a court case. Now, if you want to call it like the people's court, okay, <laughs> call, call, call it that. But yeah. you were saying that you, the judge, the jury, and the executioner, there's no justice in that. And in most cases, I've been a player before, you're already guilty. Now you have to prove your innocence. And majority of the time, when you prove your innocence, they tell you, like, one time I was fined $5,000 for socks. Socks. I, I, I told them, no, man, I had on the regulated socks. And they were like, well, you know what? We get it. We're still going to keep 2500 What? Wait a minute. Am I innocent or am I guilty? Right? And that, that's kind of the dilemma that we were facing here. And you bring up a val- very valid point. These accusations that they were made. The league didn't decide to take action until after the Super Bowl. So if you were that hard-pressed to really clamp down on the Patriots and do something about it, you should have did it before the Super Bowl was ever played, but they couldn't do it. Right? They, they couldn't do it because there was so much money in TV sponsorships involved, so they'd rather wait to the offseason to deal with it, which they did. It's... You know, the, uh, like, I don't want to gloss things over because I'm just because I'm a Patriots fan and, and you live in the real world, obviously not a Patriots fan. I'm looking at your hat, but the, you know, I think a lot of coverage on this episode is due to the fact that this was the team that, um, had the success that everyone loved to hate and you, you have Spygate open and shut. They were not following rules as they should have been. And this one. You know, the, the more probable than not, 
you know, uh, the, def- the guy who calls himself the deflator takes the footballs behind closed doors and it happened to be the bathroom. So for 90 seconds, you have to ask the question whose bladder was being emptied, his or the footballs. Like it, it, it's a narrative that needs to be discussed in the eyes of the dynasty documentary, but, but really it becomes another one of these friction inflection points between Robert Kraft and Roger Goodell, because Roger Goodell, you know, Spygate was as harmful to his reputation in the eyes of other owners as it was to Robert Kraft and the Patriots, because now you fast forward and this four game suspension for Tom Brady, uh, which is announced on May 11th after free agency, after the draft Kraft just, you know, looking back on it, felt that Goodell had to go overboard because they didn't want to see him going soft on his close friend and the Patriots owner, like other owners had accused of him. And it's great. They showed the highlight reel of the owners uh, talking to Roger Goodell throughout this. I noticed Jim Mersey, Woody Johnson, and Dan Snyder, just three upstanding members of the NFL owner group, right? Dan Snyder, certainly on an island of his own. But these are the guys allegedly in the ear of Roger Gade- uh, of Goodell saying, you know, you need to give Kraft and Brady the punishment. And, and I just, it's just so hard for me to believe that this is in earnest, the right thing across the board, um, you know, at that time and knowing how we still have no statement from the NFL when this past season, another Patriots game had underinflated footballs. You know what I mean? It's come full circle where half a decade later, uh, the Patriots and Chiefs, you know, both missed field goals. Patriots had a rookie kicker. Like, that's okay. Harrison Butker, one of the most accurate kickers in the modern NFL. Um, and, and Belichick just point blank. We had the balls measured after the game, the kicking balls. They were underinflated by two and a half pounds. Tom Brady was suspended four games for not being able to prove it. And the NFL still, from a game played in the end of December of last year, no statement on it. I, well, I just, that's where I kind of want to wrap it because they, they, they're, they're, they're arbitrary with where they decide whether or not this matters. Well, Roger Goodell in the league and the other 31 owners, they had to do something about it because they felt as though the allegations had been, you know, mounting up against the Patriots, the number of things. And here was something that they did not have physical evidence for. And the only evidence if you want to mention was were the balls themselves. Mm-hmm. But I go back to the idea that once mm-hmm. the balls are put into play, the officials touch the balls on every single play because they have to reset it. Those are the individuals who should have recognized right away that, hey, my hand just made an indentation in the ball and it shouldn't have. Let me blow the whistle. Let me check this ball and let me check the other balls. So the league decided to come down on Tom Brady because Belichick made him the scapegoat saying, hey, don't ask me, ask Tom, right? And you figure as though the quarterbacks, once again, they touch the balls. So they they should know. And and here's another thing that came up out of the situation that did show up in Dynasty. Aaron Rodgers is a quarterback who likes the ball overinflated. Uh So the rules state that it has to be at a certain PSI, it can't be under, it can't be over, then that means that that would have implicated Aaron Rodgers for doing something to violate the PSI and the balls, but nothing ever happened in that case. And I'm not saying this to kind of put Aaron Rodgers on blast, but just to point out how the evaluation, when we look at certain things, are not always equal. Yeah, Rodgers is a good example. I think it was Jackie McMullen who was being interviewed uh, talking about how there are preferences with, with certain players and you've got B-roll footage of footballs being sanded and like with tacky material, you know, stick them, I think was the example we always threw around back then. And then I think to the year before when the Vikings were going through a stadium rebuild playing outdoors, you know, they had a, they had a 12 degree game against the Carolina Panthers and Fox is, is showing sideline views of the players holding the footballs in front of the space heaters because they don't want a, a hard pill mm-hmm. because the cold, oh no, Nick, is contracting the air inside the football, making as if 
if appearing like there's less air in the football. <gasps> oh no. We're now a science podcast. Yes. Those guys doing science. Get out your well, where's, where's Bill Nine, the science guy, when you need it. Well, Bill Belichick, the science guy, explaining the physics of it, how that was omitted from the documentary, I will never understand. And how we could omit Super Bowl 49, I would never understand, Nick, because we see this on both ends. We've got the Malcolm Butler game. Uh-huh. We'll get to him. But more importantly, we've got some of the last good highlight reel footage we have of Russell Wilson as a capable quarterback in the National Football League. It's 2016. I'm kidding. Uh, you certainly is, can't use can't they? I, You can't I'm, use the Broncos footage. You're better off using Obama term one highlight reel footage for Russell Wilson when trying to tell me he's going to be an effective signal caller for the Steelers. Um, listen, this was a Seahawks team that uh, could run the football but chose not to. And uh, we're at the two yard line. Am I? I mean, listen. Um, I don't have to break this down to just one play because that would be totally hypocritical of me criticizing Dynasty and then me spending just this Super Bowl on the one play. But I'll spin it on the final drive. How about that? Uh, after a 0 0 first quarter and then a combination of 28 points in the second quarter, these were. Both incredibly balanced teams. The Seattle Seahawks were looking to become the first team since the Patriots to win back to back Super Bowls. Um, and they get a fourth quarter lead. The Patriots were down 10 to start that fourth. Julian Edelman catches the touchdown to go up 28 24 with 202 left. And again, Steelers legend Russell Wilson trots that offense out onto the field. I remember watching this play. And when Malcolm Butler tips the football up and Jermaine Curse makes this circus catch, able to fall down with it, I thought the game was over. It was David Tyree all over again for me. It was Mario Manningham for me all over again. Just two incredible plays made by both quarterback and receiver that I thought would lead to the Patriots' third straight Super Bowl loss. 2007, 2011, and now it's 20 the 2015 season nick it, it, it's been a drought since they won in 2004 well that play was uh disrupted because jermaine curtis was the guy who was on point and he was supposed to be the guy that cleared things out and used browner's body as somewhat of of a shield so for me obviously in that situation hindsight being 2020 you hand the ball to marshawn lynch Oh, we're going to the last play. Yes, you call. Why don't you describe? Why don't you? Why don't you describe the last play for me, Nick? Well, I mean, you basically in a three-man cluster formation. Everyone knows this: the guy who's on the point for the offense and the guy who's on the point for the defense. Their moves dictate the play, whether that play is going to be successful. And it's no different than the pick and roll in basketball. That's essentially what you know. Pete Carroll, Russell Wilson, and the Seahawks were trying to run. And it would have been effective. Now, what wasn't shown in the documentary was Ernie Adams finding that particular play of all plays and the Patriots practicing that play. And every single time they practice it, Malcolm Butler was beaten in practice. So who knew that in that particular moment, the Seattle Seahawks would use that particular play as their game-winning clincher that didn't go well because the guy was beaten all week in practice he makes the play of a lifetime. And once again, Jermaine Curse, he needed to pick Browner. He needed to give Browner, you know, put his body between Malcolm Butler so Butler had to go over the screen instead of under the screen, making it somewhat of an easy baseball-type throw for Russell Wilson. And I have to tell you, man, I spent time in Seattle, you know, doing a coaching internship. They always make that, that route, that play inside the red zone because the idea is you throw it low where the defender can't get it. And if your guy as a receiver dropped it, it was an incomplete pass. But lo and behold, Malcolm saw it. He jumped it. He recognized that Russell, even though he was scanning the field, he looked that way to the right side multiple times. I mean, immediately, Malcolm's thinking, okay, he's coming this way. And without any hesitation, great anticipation by Malcolm, he jumps and he takes the ball away. And there's always two 
emotional screenshots that stand out to me in that game. One on the side of Seattle Seahawks, the level of disgust on, on Richard Sherman's face, yeah. but the pure jubilation, right? That, that was once fear that turned to celebration when Tom and Jimmy G are jumping up like kids who their parents took them to Mickey D's, right? <laughs> and that personified that particular moment for both Tom Brady and it changed history when you really think about it for Russell Wilson. So it was a pivotal football moment where Malcolm Butler, the unlikely hero, yeah. would make a play. And it's crazy because later on in the series, there's something else that's going to happen with Malcolm in the Super Bowl that is going to make you scratch your head the same way that Malcolm made this play. Right. So part of that friction between Belichick doesn't extend to just Brady. Um, it, it's it's what we're going to get to on our next episode. But yeah. while staying in this episode of those guys, we're on the episode eight because Tom Brady, now as we detailed, suspended four games. We go back to uh, the heir apparent, Jimmy Garoppolo, the 67th overall pick of the 2014 draft, a guy you would work closely with with your time in San Francisco because, spoiler alert, Jimmy Garoppolo doesn't stay in New England, but he is the guy, according to Bill Belichick. Um, and Robert Kraft details it as a big move and a statement from Bill because they both knew, Kraft and Belichick, that Brady had every intention of sticking around, but Bill with his quarterback entering his age 37 season, was not sure that Brady would be there. He would go on to play eight more years. So now Kraft looks back on this and wonders if the dynamic between Bill and Tom changed forever because his draft selection was made, that being Jimmy Garoppolo. And here we go with the Dynasty documentary continuing to put a magnifying glass on these two people with more of a negative light because for the first time we're really talking about these two parting ways and not on amicable terms. Yeah, that move was uh, really big and we see a lot of teams do that. And that was part of the Patriots way culture to possibly part ways with a guy while he was still in somewhat of his prime. And you figure when Jimmy G was taken, that dynamic was going to change. That was Bill Belichick saying, you know what? I've seen that uh, this team can actually win in different ways. We won with defense when Tom first took over for Drew Bledsoe, and we've seen other quarterbacks step in and still find success. And that was Bill, like a lot of coaches, saying, okay, well, the success of the culture of this team, I built this. This is what I did. And right now, you're getting too much adulation and validation. So I'm going to bring someone else in to let you know that, guess what? Even you, the great Tom Brady, uh, can get it. But for me, it really changed a lot for Tom. And it tells you a lot about who he is as an individual. Yeah, he was suspended those four games. I think the Patriots went 3-1 and one in that yeah. time when Jimmy G, Jimmy G took over. But... For me, that was when Tom really said, you know what? To hell with this. You guys brought someone in to replace me. Now I'm going to step it up another notch, which made that conversation between Bill Belichick and Robert Kraft very interesting as far as what they were going to do with Jimmy G. Right. And Jimmy G has the shoulder sprain, um, injuries following him his entire career. Jacoby Brissett, as a rookie, steps up in his first start. They beat your Houston Texans 27-0 which kind of propelled him into becoming a career journeyman, but having opportunities to start. And look, now it was going to be in a quarterback battle uh, this year for the New England Patriots, and it all starts in 2016. Tom had never been away from the team, right? It's, it's, it's four weeks where he's on his own. Everybody's calling him a cheater, a criminal. Uh, we've got this hideous courtroom drawing that can't escape him to this day. Yeah. Um, and he... He, he finds comfort and solace returning to his alma mater at Michigan. Um, we, we go back and Bill Belichick trying to, tum, trying to humble Tom Brady in his age 37 season. You know, the documentary shows us that Tom was, was there at that point. He walked on campus, well, and recruited to play football, but he stepped on the campus as the seven-string quarterback for Lloyd Carr. And after five years, 
He finally gets the opportunity. And yet there's a younger, bigger, faster, stronger Drew Henson. That's a better athlete that Carr just wants to put in games. Um, and it's just hard for Tom to deal with because he felt he had earned his keep. He was voted a captain by the players, but coach, why don't coach want me, man? Um, and, and really kind of the prototype for JJ McCarthy, right? The last Michigan quarterback to win a national championship and now entering the NFL draft, that photo of him watching TCU celebrate at the Fiesta Bowl was exactly what I was thinking of when Tom said that he was just staring at Drew Henson, signing autographs for the fans. Hundreds lined up, and he may have signed five autographs that afternoon. Like, those Michigan men are really wired similarly. Maybe he should have tried meditation back his senior year of college. We go back to the National Football League. Week five in Cleveland. There's no competition at quarterback like we saw when Drew Bledsoe was cleared to play. Tom Brady is the guy. Um, and in part, it's because Garoppolo couldn't throw the football. He still had the shoulder strain he was dealing with. Um, shout out Apple. They must have busted their budget when they included Taylor Swift music for Tom Brady's FEA mode, if you remember what that one was, Nick. Mm -hmm. F them all. Tom Brady's incredible, but it still doesn't seem to be good enough for Bill Belichick. At least that's how they're painting it in Dynasty. Am I wrong there? No, you're not wrong, but they are setting things up for the later episodes that really explain the relationship and where the relationship went to and exactly what happened. And we will get to that, that, that later on, but it is a weird dynamic between coach and player, but more importantly, coach and quarterback. I would like to say that I've seen these things play out in real time. In my time with the Jets, and I can even say that some of these things that have taken place between Tom and Bill Belichick during the dynasty, it, it, it's taken place now between some head coaches and their quarterbacks because it's a, it's a power struggle, right? It's who's going to get the credit. And, and, and that was one of the things that came up later when you think about the dynasty, which is that of the Patriots. Was it Bill? Was it Tom? And it just seemed as though you had to decide because it wasn't both of them. And I, and I believe that, well, that's not the case. Two things can be true at the same time. But when someone is thirsty for power, when they don't know how to play with other kids in the sandbox, things get out of hand. Very relatable. Being, yes. <laughs> things get out of hand really quickly. And that's where, you know, this episode starts to taper off and kind of leads us because Things went from bad, but now they're about to get worse. We get a lot of Danny Amendola on the documentary at this point. He was Tom's guy, you know, before Julian Edelman was, and they were together, um, both very close on and off the field, uh, that relationship between quarterback and receiver. But once you see Matthew Slater, Randy Moss, Dante Stallworth, all kind of question the treatment Tom was getting, you know, this comes on the heels of a 34-16 win in the divisional round of the playoffs, and Bill is pissed about how the offense performed, even plays out there on the football field. Um, you know, it's, it's Robert Kraft saying that Brady was constantly in search of coaches' approval, and he just wouldn't get it. I mean, for what worked in 2001, like was the Johnny Foxborough act growing old? Like instead of adding fire to Tom Brady, to compete it was just adding fire to the relationship because you just you do the same thing over and over again and after 16 you know, 15 16 years of it it had finally grown old uh we'll move to super bowl 51 and ernie adams comment when asked about brady's treatment by belichick um the pain is temporary and the championship is forever losing the championship lasts forever too we get danny amendola with the quote of this entire documentary, I've seen it more than anything else when reading reviews or, you know, us talking to it, uh, probably in the teaser trailer too. Amendola's quote, we worked for Bill, but we played for Tom. And now we get the Falcons and the Patriots in Super Bowl 51, Nick. They played for Tom Brady to become the first quarterback to win five Super Bowls in NFL history. 
to etch his name, not in pencil, not in pen, but carved in stone and marble. This is going to be the greatest winner in NFL history. He needs to pass Joe Montana's four Super Bowl wins. Yeah, all of that is definitely important. And that Danny Amadola quote definitely stuck out to me. Even in, you know, when they were running the trailer, I was like, oh boy, there is something to be said about that. And it's true. As players, we play for one another. Yeah. You know, there's a name on the front of the jersey. There's a helmet. But we play for the name on the back and play for one another. And once again, this is where things started to get out of hand with the Patriots organization, because now you're having players having to draw lines in the sand and decide, well, who is really their leader? Is it the guy who's standing in front of the room with a cutoff sweatshirt? Or is it the guy who has the the model type looks? Mm -hmm. And listen, I can tell you, man, I I know exactly where, where Bill Belichick got this frame of thinking from. He got it from his mentor, you know, Bill Parcells. I've seen it. I've been a part of it. The idea is that you don't like the media. You don't love the media. You don't say crap to the media because they're not your friend. We told the company line. But in some cases, it's like, no, the coaches want to tell their line, but what they're asking you to do is entirely different. And the fact of starting meetings ripping Tom, for me, that was an emasculating move because when you do it solo, it is just you and the player. But when you do it in front of other grown men. And they do full team meetings. Patriots were notorious for that. And now they go, wow, if he did that to Tom, what would he do to me? And the reason I know it all too well, I watched Parcells do it to Vinny Testaverde and Curtis Martin. So as a young player for the Jets, I was like, I need to shut up and fly straight. Because once again, if he's doing it to them, what will he do to a guy who's an undrafted player? So it's a way to control the energy in the room with players. So, so players wouldn't get out, out of order. It's almost like a, a jail type mindset. Like when you go to jail and you want to prevent people from bothering you, you got to find out that find the toughest, hardest person in the jail and you show what you can do against them. That's exactly what Bill Belichick was doing to Tom. And he got to a point where the players started to recognize it. And they were like, wow. And even, I think it was, what was it? Wes Welker was just like, at one during one episode, he was like, hey man, at some point, when are you going to stand up for yourself? This is me paraphrasing. But he was just like, well, you're just kind of his whipping boy. Uh-huh. And that's what Tom became because... Tom, based on the Michigan days that you were talking about, when he wasn't getting the validation, he was trying to prove himself. But then it gets to a point where Tom figures, though, I don't have to do that that anymore. I've already proved myself. I've stepped into that goat role. Well, uh, if he has to prove himself to those that need to see five is greater than four, uh, we've got an uphill battle here, Nick. It is 21-0 at the half. Uh, Brady... um, reiterates the words from Bill Belichick saying that you leading up, you cannot give up a lead to this Falcons team. Um, Bill said the exact same thing in the documentary, almost verbatim uh, for what he did back then. Brady's picked off by Robert Alford. The, not the last time he'll get his hands on a football in this game. We'll get to that. Uh, Robert Alford goes 80 plus yards for the pick six. It's 21, nothing. And by the second half, it's 28 to three. And what better perspective than that of Scott Pioli, who we haven't seen in quite some time, uh, as the assistant GM working out under Thomas Dimitrioff, um, the bikeling fanatic himself, uh, both of them longtime employees in the Patriots front offense, front office, office, knowing as though they've seen this before from Tom. And for most of the people watching this game that, work for the Atlanta Falcons. They see a 25 point lead and they are celebrating They're high fiving and Pioli. It's almost as if sitting down for the documentary, he pulls the camera like closer to him. And I I just, I love this quote. And as a uh, horror film buff, I need your proper film evaluation on this. His quote, you effing people don't get it. Stop celebrating that guy. Number 12 across the field 
is Freddy effing Krueger. He's coming back and he's going to get a bunch of us. I just hope he doesn't get us all. Pioli would know better than best when talking about Brady. Yeah, he would because he's been around it. He knows what he is made of. And he knew that Tom's legacy was hanging in the balance. For a guy that grew up in the Bay Area, worshiping the 49ers and Joe Montana, he wanted to make sure that he not just cemented himself as one of the best quarterbacks to ever play the game, but you do it by surpassing someone that you looked up to. Rarely in life does that happen. So Scott Pioli knew what Arthur Blank, Ludacris, and every other Falcons <laughs> who were celebrating, who were calling me, telling me during that time, you're about to get there. They were about to get the chip. And they're first, did, yeah. And, you know, there was a conversation. I think it was, I can't remember the receiver who was talking to uh, Muhammad Sanu on the sideline. And that receiver told Muhammad, he was like, hey, man, that's Tom Brady, man. So this thing isn't over. And for Tom to do something to that magnitude, and granted, it was a team effort. It wasn't just Tom, but just Tom being on that field and being, being a part of it after things went so terribly wrong in the first three quarters to now, in a matter of a quarter, change, I mean, your history, and then change the history of the Atlanta Falcons. I mean, that, that was football personified. Now, to the more important film evaluation of it, I know he said Freddie Effing Kruger. I'm kind of getting more of a Jason Voorhees kind of yeah, vibe to Tom Brady. Yeah. Right? I'm not, I'm, not out of, I'm not on my own on this. Or, what, or, or, or even Candyman. Even Candyman. Well, <laughs> Matt Ryan out there on the sidelines staring at the tablet going, Tom Brady, Tom Brady, Tom oh. Brady, and one more, Tom Brady. Yeah. That's four straight scoring drives in the second half, uh, including. 10 plays, 91 yards with 330 left in that game. Robert Alford gets his hands on the football again. I, you know, I love Julian Edelman. He's just, yeah, I ran a bad route. That was totally my fault. Uh, looking back on it now and Alford jumps the route and instead of grabbing it, running the opposite length of the field, like he had 30 minutes ago in the game, he tips the ball straight up into the air. Not too different from what we just saw from Malcolm Butler. And then Julian Edelman just gets this incredible double clutch catch. And it was really cool. I'd never seen the footage of him and um, him and Alford, like going back and forth on the field, watching the replay on the jumbotron. Like mm -hmm. that was, that's pretty cool. That's, that's like a very intimate, very cool moment. Uh, and look, they tie that game up. There was a first down. They drive the length of the field. They tie it up. They've got all the momentum going into overtime. Uh, Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen haven't complained about not getting the football yet. So Patriots get the fall, the ball first. Brady completes five straight passes. James White punches it in. 31 unanswered. The greatest comeback in Super Bowl history. And my favorite, hey, look, it's Roger Goodell again. All he has to say to Tom Brady, nine months after the four-game suspension, all the best, Tom. And then off he goes. Well, at that point, what more can you say? I mean, you, <laughs> we have this on long drawn out process, this Ted Wells report, you know, 400 or whatever, 4,000 pages of it. You suspend Tom for four games. You make him the poster child of what's wrong with football, especially with the Patriots. And then what does he do? He gets motivated. He wins the Super Bowl. And now you have to hand him a trophy. And there were certain, there were so many moments over the Patriots' time winning Super Bowls where they've been in situations like this, and they've all said that this one is better than the previous one based on the things that they went through. Mm -hmm. And for, for me, this is a hell of a documentary about not just a football team, but about Tom Brady, Bill Belichick, and Robert Kraft. It's almost like the Star Wars saga, if you will. Oh, regale me. Yes. So it's kind of like that because, I mean, Darth Vader ruled the galaxy. Who's Darth Vader? Right. And in this case, Darth Vader, you can say, well, it was the Patriots as, as a whole. But if you want to surmise it, I would even say that Darth Vader now comes down to Bill Belichick. Well, he wears the hood. Like, that's that's the dead he's, giveaway. He's, well, he's more like uh, maybe Palpatine, right? So he's like Palpatine and people consider Tom Brady to be more... Darth Vader, but in this particular 
uh, situation that I'm delivering, it's almost like it was like Belichick was Darth Vader and Tom Brady was you know, Luke Skywalker. He's always looking to, you know, please his dad, always under his dad's mm. uh, umbrella. But, you know, it's one of those things. And once again, just like with Star Wars and Darth Vader, everything was centered around power. And Belichick wanted a lot of it. He got a lot of it because he did some great things. But sometimes that power in the wrong hands is not always great. Well, here's another reference to uh, Jason Voorhees because I described the close to episode eight as a hatchet job on Bill Belichick's legacy because they basically leave us with the comment, is it time to let the old dog out to pasture or do we let him continue to run? That being Tom Brady, him being Nick, Nick Ferguson. I'm Alex Hardy. I can barely talk anymore because I'm still reeling from reliving to Flategate, just knowing where I was at that time. One of those moments in history, you just know where you were, you know what you had for lunch. And I know what I have. I've got a great partner in Nick Ferguson who was there for the rise of the New England Patriots and what we are doomed to be hold the fall in the final installment of those guys recap of the dynasty documentary. Nick, this is the close of the penultimate episode. Any words you'd like to leave for our audience? Uh, if they want to listen back to all of our episodes right here, uh, Apple podcast or find your podcast or on our YouTube channel, uh, you can also find our feed talking about the NFL news, free agency, uh, teams starting to form. We're doing our draft prep coming up later this week. So make sure you check that all out there, Nick. Uh, any words of encouragement for anyone that is, you know, dealing with the power struggle or maybe doesn't want to quite get to the end of this documentary yet? Well, there's always a light side. There's always a dark side. And the decisions that we make will determine which side that we lean more heavily towards. So be consciously aware of the decisions that you make. At Nick Ferguson underscore 25, former NFL safety, was there for Tom Brady's first game. And look, here he is going to talk about the downfall of this team when we're back on the next time those guys recap the Patriots Dynasty documentary on Apple TV. Nick, as always, it's a pleasure, my man. I, I can't, I don't, I don't want it to end. I don't want to, I don't want to go to reality. We're literally going to wrap up this episode and then talk about why the Patriots are picking third overall. I can't do it. Well, as they say, all good things must come to an end. And let's be totally honest. Patriots fans have been blessed. They have been spoiled. Over 20 years of football dominance. It's okay to now watch someone else carry the torch. And that's what we'll see very soon. Agree to disagree, Nick. Yeah. Peace. Peace.